It is a real pleasure to welcome back to the program Jane McAlevey. She is Senior Policy Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley's Labor Center, co-author of Rules to Win By, Power and Participation in Union Negotiations. She co-wrote it with Abby Lawler. Uh, Jane, welcome back to the program. You know, as I realize this, like, I, I think it's possible that you're one of our more fr most frequent guests that we've had over the past three or four years. Um, and... We, we generally don't uh, have folks on too, too much, uh, you know, in a row, a lot of books to get to, a lot of different people. Uh, but this has been, I think, at least in my uh, lifetime, I think, well, I shouldn't say that, but because uh, that's been a little bit longer than maybe I want to. But certainly within the past, like, I, I feel like three decades, the most active uh union labor period that we have experienced and uh so many people have told us that you know uh, talking to you has been so helpful in when they try and unionize their workplaces uh and you have uh, basically written a uh, a sequel to your organizing book no shortcuts um just remind us what no shortcuts was about and then we can sort of set up what this sort of next step is yeah Great. First of all, um, I'm flattered, honestly, um, that I'm here so often uh, because I think it's a show. Um, so no shortcuts. I mean, the sort of either you know, four books in ten years, right? And they were all. In, I mean, the first one was an accident, and then the rest of them almost were, except for this one. Um, so this one's a sequel to No Shortcuts, and No Shortcuts was my late in life PhD dissertation, um, but. But the evidence for it and all the knowledge for it, of course, came from workers in the field. I mean, that's just that's where I've learned everything um, is fight by fight in the field. So you no know, shortcuts basically said, hey, there's a lot of talk out there about organizing. Um, and the truth is, in my observation, most people who talk about organizing aren't actually doing organizing, which I define. The whole book is about defining what's mobilizing which is when you're focused on the people who already agree with you, but you're trying to get them off the couch to take action versus organizing, which is when we're actually focused every single day on people who are mostly undecided about whether or not they self-identify with any movement. And often, as I argue, initially think they're opposed to whatever the cause is, in this case, a trade union. And that's in part because of the extraordinary multi-billionaire effort to demonize what a trade union has been for so long. So the real, what I was trying to met out was that in the era I came in as a trade union organizer full-time, as a senior organizer at the National American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations in 1996, um, we're all getting old here, um, in 1996 when I began, you know, there's a lot of talk that we we're trying to do organizing, that we're going to reorganize the labor movement. And in short, my analysis of my time with both the National National AFL-CIO and then as National Deputy Director at the SEIU with both of them in that first decade was, in fact, we weren't organizing. We were doing something called mobilizing. We were relying on a small number of workers who already agreed with us. And then the narrative became that organizing didn't work. And that's what made me sit down kind of angry um, to write a book that said, let's get clear about what we need more of, which is organizing. And when we actually do it correctly, those of us who do it, we just keep winning. And if we take these shortcuts, which is mobilizing and getting a telegenic worker in front of a TV camera, that ain't organizing. And you simply can't get to the kind of super majorities that we saw on the LA picket lines recently in Los Angeles, right, with the educators. I think we're about to see on the WGA lines today, the Writers Guild, um, sorry, um, on the Oakland education strike lines that begin uh, Thursday um, or tomorrow, actually, right? Um, and you're right, there's a lot happening. So, so No Shortcuts really says, wait a minute. It's, it's a challenge to the national trade union movement. And it says, hell yes, organizing works. Um, you've abandoned it. You've abandoned workers as the central agents in our own salvation. And you've taken these shortcuts about shareholder damage and crashing stock prices um, and clever things that actually don't work. And you're calling them organizing. 
So what I was trying to really parse out for people is organizing does still work. It's about base expansion. Are we bringing people into the movement who who previously weren't involved? Then you get to mobilize them. You know, then you get to put them out on a picket line or uh, help them understand, you know, who they might want to vote for um, in an election. But the first step is rebuilding a base of people in this country um, in in supermajority levels that that leads to the kind of victory that we saw in Los Angeles with a 30 percent raise off of a three day strike recently. Right. A 30 percent raise. That's the kind of gains that workers need in this country after taking it in the neck from, you know, everything that's been going wrong for 50 years. Someone had asked me, um, it was a while back, uh, someone had asked me about your book, and I had summed it up in, in borrowing a phrase I had heard uh, quite a bit in terms of uh, when you're supposed to hire a lawyer, but it was basically the best time to organize is when you don't need to uh, to have the organization yet. Uh, like, you can't mobilize unless you have already done the work uh, prior to that and, 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 and begun to organize. And, and I, I don't know, it's, uh, I don't know if it's all been since the last time that you've been on, but we've talked about, uh, we have talked, uh, to a couple of the people who were in the, uh, the, the, uh, in Buffalo organizing the Starbucks people. We've talked to people in Trader Joe's. We have talked to, uh, musicians and, uh, teachers. And, um, you know, the one thing that, uh, that I think, uh, really, uh, um, at, at least in, in in part to your work, is that people starting to understand they need to start to build relationships way before they can mobilize anything. And so, and then one of the things that I have uh, subsequently learned too is uh, from we just had on uh, uh, organizers from uh, Starbucks when 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 Schultz was was talking was um, this gap between the unionization and the actual first contract and that that is in many ways almost as um perilous a time if not more so than the run-up to the unionization effort in the first place because uh the the desire to break the union does not end prior to the election it goes through all particularly until that first contract Tell us about that dynamic, because I think in your book you you cite uh, something like fifty two percent of new unions do not have a contract within the first year. Um, uh, just tell us about that dynamic. Yeah, um, and we're we're seeing it actually in the Starbucks campaign in a couple of headlines in the last week. So um, yes, uh, this is why organizers say the organizing never stops. Right, it can't stop. Um, so under under United States um, labor law, which I think I've probably said before, I prefer to call boss law or employer law because the idea that it works for workers is a bit of a myth. But under the National Labor Relations Act and, and under sort of currently settled law, most people in this country think that when workers vote to form a union, they just go right into contract negotiations and somehow there's some obligation on the part of the employer to sit down and be fair and start negotiating, right? Hey, a majority of workers voted for the union. No, <laughs> no, no, no. And not only does that not happen, but under labor law at the 12 month mark, if your union has been certified, and in the case of some of the Starbucks elections, the early ones, they, they got certified. If your union, ha unlike Amazon, contrast that, right? There's no certification still of that election. Amazon's taking a different approach. They're gonna fight even saying that there is a union. So what I'm about to say doesn't even really apply to them. At Starbucks, the unions got certified by the National Labor Relations Board. This was a valid election, yada, yada. Okay. What happens under labor law is that if there is not a union contract negotiated within 12 months, the employer, though officially the law says workers, um, may then file for what's called a decertification of the union. Um, in essence, uh, the original intent was, you know, if it's not getting you anything, feel free to throw the union out. But what that has become for all of our lifetimes has become the second chance to destroy the worker organization. Not only, does, not only has it become that, it's like they, you know, they're totally motivated by that, right? They understand all they have to do is drag this crap out for 12 more months and they can go inspire, inspire would be the polite word. Um, because officially the employer can't do this. 
Um, in every campaign where I've ever faced such a hurdle, which you might imagine I have, having gone up against some of the biggest private sector employers in the healthcare industry, who will spend as much money as Amazon, you know, to bust the union. Um, we know exactly how it happens, right? You have to get 30% of workers to say, I'm dissatisfied with the union. The employer runs a message saying, hey, it's been 12 months and you don't have a contract yet. Why don't you throw the bums out and we'll cut a better deal with you? Well, only reason there isn't a contract in that 12 months is because the employer kept the union busters there and just kept running divide and conquer. They go form a little committee. This goes back to something I covered in my previous book. They go back to, this goes back to 1939 in the Sears and Roebuck Corporation. This is actually where they figured it out. They collect the bosses at Sears and Roebuck, a titan in the 1930s, went to the University of Chicago, where they were headquarters, right? The Sears, Sears Tower, Sears World Headquarters was in Chicago. They went to the University of Chicago Behavioral um, uh, Psychology Department, uh, which was very preeminent at the time. I remember Alinsky, well, there was a whole bunch of interesting people there, but for different reasons. Famously, behavioral uh, sociology and behavioral psych department. And they actually hired them. And what they, this is the beginning of official union busting. And what they came to was as long as they got workers, a workers committee, if they could find a few workers to call it the workers committee to throw the union out, they stood a better chance of winning. So they officially never look like it's them. And under labor law, they can't officially, the boss, be the one who does it. But in my lifetime, they will pull a bunch of workers into a broom closet in a hospital. Um, and after dragging things out for 12 months, after the workers won, they will say, um, hey, this is pretty awful. You know, why don't we just get rid of it and go back to the way things were? Um, and, you know, it's only if you've done the organizing work. It's only if you've identified the correct leaders, the real worker leaders. It's only if you've done a good job up front as union organizers of telling this to workers from day one, day one. And that's where some People take shortcuts and don't do it, right? In my life experience, I say from day one, by the way, as soon as you win the election, get ready for the hard part of the fight because that's what's going to come next is actually winning your contract. So everything that we do to build our power in the lead up to a National Labor Relations Board election has to like set us up to then go for the next round of the fight. And we better be in a great position uh, to force the employer's hand. So yeah, that's how it works. It's an extraordinarily, it's, it's so, that's why I call it boss law or employer law. It's, it's you call it labor laws. Well, a stretch. Uh, well um, what do you say when you see major co corporations like Amazon and Starbucks union busting just because they can, because they are these major corporations that can just eat the fees? It's nothing to them. It's the cost of doing business. In fact, it's actually in the long term much more beneficial for them to send a message uh, for their corporate profits than it is to abide by the letter of the law. Like, how do you communicate that to organizers that this might happen and we're in this for the, for the long fight? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it is part of why, um, you know, every couple of years after running some campaigns, I just decide and watching who's doing good work, I just decide to write another book. Because one, I want to keep showing um, that despite all these barriers, actually workers win, right? When we when we do our work right, um, we still can win. That's been the point of every single one of the books. So it starts with being transparent, clear, and open from, from the minute you're talking to workers. Um, this is going to be a hard fight. Uh, you frame the choice. Um, you can either choose to live with undignified pay, no respect, bad scheduling, no staff, not enough people. Um, and feel like you left, you know, every day when you leave the workplace, you're in a, you're like, you were in a combat zone and you're so exhausted and freaked out like nurses and healthcare workers are that they feel like they're going to PTSD every day when they leave their shift, right? So you've got to find the choice. You can either choose to do nothing, don't form a union um, and keep living with the horrible conditions you're living in, or you can choose to do something about it and form a union. But I want to be honest from day one, it's going to take a hell of a lot of work. And the more honest you are, the more you treat workers with the, like they have big brains. They actually are smart people, right? They run the economy really indirectly. So it's like the more you acknowledge up front what it's really going to take to win, that's what staves off the ability for the employer to, to run a decertification at the 12 month mark, right? It's when it's a surprise. It's when, uh, you know, not effective unions will not tell all these things that are going to happen. It's like, we do what's called inoculation and transparency. You've just got to be clear from day one that there is going to be 
a hell of a fight to come. And the first thing we have to do is get strong enough inside this workplace to win the vote. And the minute we win the vote in, in the method I write about and talk about in No Shortcuts and certainly in the new book um, and in all of them, and what I practice is the minute we've won that vote, we're going to start to build the support team around those workers. So uh, we're going to chart, we're going to have the workers begin to chart their connections to the broader community. We're going to have them start to go talk to their ministers, their faith leaders, their soccer, you know, if it was Vegas, it was like soccer clubs, football, you know, depending on where you are in the world, um, whatever it's going to take uh, to actually have enough support around the workers to realize they made a good decision really matters when the, when the, when the, when the fight is like, feels like a slog um, and you've got to bring the community into that fight. And in the case of some of the newer retail folks, I think the missing element still, honestly, is They've got a, we've got a refound a consumers union as strong as the one we had in the early 1900s when the cigar workers and a bunch of unions built a real consumers union that when they said, you know, look for the label, write the old song of like, look for the, don't ask me to sing, I'm horrible, I can chant, but, you know, look for the union label, which is this, came out of a consumers union in 1905. Um, and that's a missing element, I think, in some of the recent work we're doing, like, hello, I keep saying someone needs to go form that organization and do it really well. And it can't be people who take shortcuts. It can't be advocacy types and stuff. It actually has to be organizers, right? Who actually know how to build an organization of consumers who are gonna become a key weapon um, in some of these higher turnover workplaces. But for the vast majority of people, whether it's Teamsters, UAW, Oakland teachers who are about to go on strike, the WGA, I mean, most workers have access to a lot of power in their own community and the labor movement just leaves that power sitting on the table. And that's what I'm talking about in the new book, right? I mean, I wanted to call the book Leave No Power on the Table, to be perfectly honest, because we're in a climate where you have to do a power structure analysis and maximize every single piece of how the boss is going to go after you and how much power you can build. And what I've been saying to workers, I mean, involved in a big campaign I can't, of course, talk about. <laughs> it's always the most interesting work, can't talk about it yet. But like, what I'm always saying to people is, if you don't do a power structure analysis effectively, and if, and if you leave the community out, um, it isn't just that you're leaving power on the table, it's that the employer class is gonna step into that space and rip the power from you. So really the new book is about like, leaving no power on the table in an era of vicious union busting. We won in the 30s by not letting power on the table and doing a good power analysis and being honest and transparent and clear and leading with worker leaders. And those of us doing it are still winning um, today using the same methods, basically. Uh, I got there's a lot in there. I, I, I was I was determined to have my next question uh, go directly to some of these case studies. But I still have a couple of general ones now that you've raised. I mean, just uh, we're working backwards from that, like the the idea of. Um, and and I've heard what you've what you're describing uh, when when you ask your members to go into the community, find the sources of like uh, shared grievance, shared experience, uh, shared um, I guess uh, values that um, as um, as uh, social justice unionism as opposed to managerial one. And and I think I first heard that from Barbara Maglioni who was uh, a longtime uh, uh, head of the, the Massachusetts uh, school. And, and, and that union has, has very successfully organized against like the charter expansion and many other things. Um, but that yeah. idea of like, it, it's almost uh, a, a equivalent to, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. If, if the union doesn't access the power that resides in the community, um, the employer will will grab that power. How does that happen? Like, is it is it you know, if if you're not going to those folks and and making your case, the employer is going to come in and have them work against the unionization effort. Yeah, absolutely. The, the the best example, meaning a horrific example. The best example um, was the attempt by the previous leadership of the United Auto Workers. Thank goodness, there's been a big change there. But in the old guard leadership of the corrupt UAW, um, in the big election that was probably uh, seven or eight years ago in Tennessee, um, were there where the United Auto Workers had actually gotten an agreement for what was called a fair election procedure, an election procedure agreement. Um, was it the Nissan it. plant in Tennessee? BMW. Oh, BMW. BMW. Okay. Tennessee. Nissan was Alabama. Um, so it went before that, and yeah, it was BMW and Volkswagen. Specifically, Volkswagen, 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 right, right, right. So I'm like reaching back because the example was so real 
So what's what this would mean about shortcuts, okay? Um, the the old UAW leadership, not very creative, pretty corrupt, um, went and thought, you know, we're gonna have an easy time because now we've got the European Union, um, Ige Mattel, um, to, to get the employer to say they won't fight the union. Well, there's a little misunderstanding of the power analysis there, just for starters. So that meant that they sent like the B, or I said in an article, UAW sent like a C team in, in terms of people who knew what they were doing. Um, so that's a problem. But they did that based on the false assumption that the employer wouldn't fight back. Well, what the employer did to make a long story very short um, is they kind of, kind of followed the letter of the law. Like they didn't form the committee and fight back inside the workplace. They literally organized the wives, very gendered, right? It's famous. Uh, they went and organized the wives um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, and the churches and the right-wing politicians, by the way, we're talking about Tennessee, so everyone has a little familiarity with how conservative that place is from recent happenings there. Um, they went and literally, when I was interviewing people, went to the wives and the wives, uh, thinking about losing their jobs, went to their parishes, the parishes went to the politicians, and all of them ran a gigantic campaign to vote no against the union. And it worked. So that's the most like obvious example of literally um, a corporation figuring out we can get around this election procedure agreement, fair election agreement, um, by going to organize in the community to go against, uh, to persuade the workers. So the wives organized their husbands to vote no in the end. It was amazing. And I think I, if I remember correctly, it, it, it got national attention because you had um, federal senators get involved in that. I don't know if who it was like Cor Corker, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and I don't yeah. remember who the other That's senator probably, was, but right. I remember that was that that garnered a lot of attention to hear a senator talk about a unionization. I, I mean, uh, against the unionization drive in, you know, their state. That's a uh, I mean, that's that was uh, unique. Um, all right. Well, that's a perfect example of, of that. Like you can't, you any, any source of potential power for you is also a source of potential power for, uh, for management uh, in, in that instance. The other thing, consumer union. I don't know if people are familiar with that concept today, really. Uh, I mean, I remember the, uh, look for the union label, uh, ads, um, but I don't know if there's been any really in the past, I feel like 40 years, frankly. Um, but I remember as a kid watching uh, TV and seeing that what, what is a consumer union? Yeah. I mean, uh, we must be sitting at about the same age cause it, it wasn't active in our lifetime, but it was like the leftover. It was on TV commercials, right? When we were young. Um, and it's probably not a song that more recent generations have even heard. Um, you know, it was a real union meaning, um, People came together. That certainly, it had support of some of the smarter unions. I think it was this. If, if I do my history right, it was the cigar workers union um, that actually began that inspired it. Um, there's a middle tier of unions in the turn of the two centuries ago, um, where they understood that if the consumers continued to buy their product, that their strike would be less effective. And so there was a really strong, just call it an organization. It was nice. It was called a union. Right. But now the consumer consumer groups today are like, you know, tell you whether or not the product is good as opposed to whether or not the workers have a living wage or their slave conditions in them. So what, what we are desperate for, um, you know, we could outline how to build it if we want to just brainstorming. But we're desperate for, um, I think, a, a sort of faith um, an institution based national organization um, that has the moral authority and the credibility uh, and the focus. To, to, to once again make it so that on the consumer retail side, we get away from individualism, which is the hype of our lifetimes, and we move people back to the idea of the collective. And I think there's so much evidence that every time we actually have these kind of frank conversations with ordinary people, they get the collective, they get it. And the conditions are so extreme now, they get it. So, you know, what the Consumers Union did 120 years ago, 115 years ago, was they would investigate and they would say, okay, um, we're going to boycott this product to support the workers. Um, and people signed up and pledged to do that and really actually did it. Now, given the hyper individualism that has been created uh, intentionally in the last 50 years, um, and the idea that collective is bad, individual is good, collective is bad, and social media and all this stuff, um, people might say it's impossible. But that's the same thing trade union 
leaders say about organizing, right? And strikes and look at all the organizing and strikes going on. So just saying, um, again, it's when we do it right. So, I, you know, you could go, I like to me, the association of American Association of Retired People, like senior groups, um, faith houses, like you could start to build a strategy of a quick way, not a shortcut way, but a quick and effective way to build a real consumer union based in some of the institutions that already exist that have real reach into a real base in this country um, and who I think could very easily be moved um, into the idea that fairness at work uh, is a value that matters. And, and so something like that could be deployed. Uh, there's a strike at uh, Starbucks or they can't get their contract. Um, and the consumer union would say, we're calling on all our members to uh, buy your coffee somewhere else, uh, you know, until further notice type of situation or. Uh... Yes, for sure. But also quickly, it'd have to be institutional. Like when you think about Starbucks, for example, um, there's all these institutional relationships between airports and star like little individuals will be one part of it. But the reason I was saying the AARP houses of faith, like it have to be institutional consumers um, uh, hospitals, universities, like you'd have to just go to war and say, you know, students, we're not going to let our university purchase from here. We're going to be part of the consumers union. So you'd have to make it strategic like everything else. Right. And that's about thinking the power of structure analysis through, but it, it would take about 30 minutes to do it. We don't want to do that on the whole show, but that's what we would be doing to make it effective. And so the idea is that you also have almost like a wholesale power as well as the sort of the retail uh, power associated with it. All right. Well, let's go on to, uh, you know, some of these um, uh, the 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 case studies in your book, which basically are experiences that you had uh, over the years, which were um, more effective than others. I mean, part of what you're trying to sort of dispel, and I think you've already done uh, as we've talked, is like the 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 lessons that you have garnered that the legacy unions failed to understand um i feel like that's really the entire sort of uh, you know the generalization of all the books but w- one thing that stuck out for me i guess was you know actually not in your book but it w- but but w- lessons that have feel like they've been learned was like in this amalgamated uh, um i think you've wrote about the this the amalgamated transit in kentucky when they started to negotiate the first rule that management wanted condition before they sit down was like, you can't share what we're negotiating with what, what our negotiations with the rest of your membership until we come to a deal. Um, they rejected that. And, you know, you could see within the context of, of your other case studies, the, the relevance of that. But will you explain to us why that was so important why yeah. that was such the right move to make for the amalgamated workers? Yeah, that story really wrote itself. That's what I like to write when it, when workers do such smart things and it, they just tell the lesson like the Chattanooga story uh, we just talked about. But that was not a good example. But um, yeah, so the, the, there's two things that are related um, that we talk about in the book. One is something called ground rules. Um, and I'm going to argue... There's no number, but no one's challenged it. I think 95, at least 95% of all trade unions in the United States, that feels like a safe number to me, which is horrific, um, operate under what's called ground rules. So they engage in a negotiation with their employer, sort of pre-sitting down at the table, and they hammer out something called ground rules, which are legal under labor law. Very important thing for people who are facing negotiations and thinking about unionization. They're what we call in the Byzantine nature of labor law. They're what we call non-mandatory subjects of bargaining. Okay. There's mandatory subjects of bargaining, which both parties must agree to take up or there can be charges filed against you. Then there's non-mandatory subjects of bargaining. And we have a lot of information about this in the new book um, because there's so much confusion about it. So ground rules fall under a non-mandatory subject of bargaining or negotiations, which means you don't have to talk about them. Now, who wants either a corrupt union and or every bad boss um, or a lazy union that wants ground rules that the first one of which is usually what's called a gag order, which says we agree there's a few varieties of them. The most common one is we agree not to talk to the media during the course of negotiations. 
who violates it first every damn time when the fight gets to a head? Okay, the boss. So for everyone who's ever signed one of those things, there's like lesson after lesson that the employer will violate it first. But anyway, but what it but the but the majority of unions still actually sign off on language that says we agree not to talk to the media nor to our own members until such time as a full tentative agreement has been reached. Um, and then they come out of months or years, depending on the union, of negotiations, and no one, no member's been briefed on what is going on in their own negotiations. Uh, that led to the John Deere rejection of a contract a couple of years ago, by the way. Um, and it's uh, it, it, it's so counterintuitive to me, but that's because I was trained by really good trade union leaders, right, when I was a young organizer. Um, uh, so in the case of the case I wrote about recently um, from Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, Amalgamated Transit Workers Union leader, um, she was the first one, um, Lillian, uh, was the first one, a black woman, in the union, because they just passed a national policy and no other union has it. So first I was I was sitting down to write about that they had voted in October of last year, October of 2022 at their national convention. Again, more reform-minded leadership getting serious about organizing. They passed a national resolution um, saying that they embrace transparent, big and open negotiations, uh, which are the three tests that we're using in the book. Like, are you operating full transparency? You cannot sign a gag rule that says you won't talk to your members if you do that. Um, uh, and then, you know, are you looking at a big committee and are you letting all the members covered by the agreement in the room? So come back to those other two. But on this one, she had a lot of pressure um, to sign the ground rule. She was newly elected, um, black woman, um, hadn't been many of them in leadership of her union and at a bus transit agency. Uh, and she didn't take the bait. So she said, you know, I've been told by my national union, I don't have to sign these things and I'm not signing them. And within weeks, one of the first proposals was this really racist proposal called the 321 proposal, which was to give the largest raise, a 3% raise to like the handful of white workers who work for the transit agency, which were like the highest tier kind of engineers uh, for buses and keeping things moving and then give a 2% raise to the largest unit, which is mostly women of color, bus drivers, and then um, to give a 1% raise to mostly African-American men who clean and do maintenance um, around all the bus depots and all the terminals and stuff. So the 3 to one proposal is wildly racist, which she points out right away. Like, what do you mean you're gonna give 3% to the handful of... So um, had she signed that, gag order or any ground rule. She, she she took the same position that I have taken my entire life. I've never signed a ground rule in my life, never even negotiated them. Boss comes in, says, well, it's time to negotiate ground rules. Actually, they'll do it ahead of time. They won't even do it in front of the workers. They'll just email a bad union and they'll do it in email. But I digress. But, you know, they'll walk in the room and say, OK, let's let's start off with our proposed ground rules. No talking to the media, no talking to the members, no sharing information, no blah, blah, blah. Um, and I always just wait for that moment, you know, and I say, yeah, thanks for sharing. We really appreciate that and proposal on your part. But since it's not a mandatory subject of negotiations, we'd like to get right to it. Because that's all you have to do. And she did it. And that allowed her to go build the union probably two or three times more powerful than it was going to be to begin with in that fight, because she got to go say to everyone, there are some really racist proposals coming from management. And then it got even worse, which I talk about, um, where the employer as sort of when she said, we're going to let all the members come to negotiations, the employer said, you know, let's, uh, why don't we just negotiate at the zoo? By the way, you can have a view of the orangutan um, exhibit. <laughs> and that was all real. And there's, you know, like when I was writing in The Nation, I had to show them the actual email exchanges, which the lawyers have for the union. So, um, you know, the level of racism was dripping both in the wage proposals and just in general. And, and that allowed that union to grow stronger than it's ever been and win a terrific contract where they got 6% across the board raises for every single worker near one of the contract, 4% in year two. There's just a lot of smart things that you can do when you don't bind yourself um, and you don't engage your own members in the fight. It's interesting, too, because it, the 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 ground rules really seem, I mean, I guess theoretically I could come up with some ideas of ground rules that would not be necessarily um inhibit the power of a union but it's it's almost like you know 
Matt, who's six three or something, and I, who's six foot ish, um, were to agree on ground rules when we, you know, before we play a basketball game, no jumping. Well, we're both subject to those, but I mean, it's going to benefit him. You know, when you have a top down system for the management, that works because that's their entire, that's their entire uh, sort of like source of authority is top down. It's the opposite when it comes to unions. The authority that these negotiators have is because of the power of the union of everybody involved in the union and to cut them off from that. Uh, it does seem sort of like intuitively like that's a bad idea. That's, that's where all your power comes from. Um, and, uh, it, it's an interesting dynamic. It's also sort of fascinating to me that it's not, it, it clearly hasn't been obvious to a lot of, of unions. Um, what, give us an example uh within the context i mean we should say that you you give um there's about well you have about uh, seven chapters where you cover uh experience you've had with philadelphia nurses new jersey teachers um news writers journalists both in new york and la uh nurses out in western mass uh hotel workers in um in uh in marriott i guess i don't and and then in in, in berlin some uh hospital workers what what would you say like i don't know i mean what um uh it's i, I we, we can't cover all of them what for you what are the uh, what are some one of the two or three key lessons out of those fights that you you pulled out yeah the lessons start with the one we were just on, which is full transparency. Um, and by the way, the, the WGA, the Writers Guild, is exercising full transparency. Um, they have been wildly publishing. Um, I just saw it on Twitter again this morning, too. Like, they're publishing their demands, right? Like, the idea that it somehow helps you to keep your demands secret is just, it's, anyway. And um, the so Writers Guild, we should say, like, the Writers Guild, uh, I mean, I was a former member back in the day. When, when I was in that business and I remember the, they would always say like, we know you guys are real individuals and you don't like, and, and there's like, I don't know, there's something, I guess, 11,500 or so uh, members. And uh, they are, they, you know, writers are pretty solitary uh, people. And they, you know, in my experience in that business, they all think that they're better than everybody else. Uh, that's the way that you, <laughs> you succeed in there. And, Opening it up to everybody at least makes it what, what it seems to me to do is it also like there's and there's I mean, I, I have specific people who come to mind from the last uh, writer strike, but there are people who really have the ability uh, to undercut the power of the union and the, and the less transparency, the easier it is for some of those people to do so because they're like you don't know what they're doing behind closed doors these guys are idiots they're giving away the house or they're they're doing this and that the more transparent it is at least there's a there's a level of trust there's a level of buy-in you feel like you have an impact on stuff because you're speaking specifically to specifics um but 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 go ahead uh yeah I, no absolutely um so what so that there, there were there, there i mean we sort of walk away um I started to call it high, um, but by the time the book came out, I had changed my language that I've been using for years, which was transparent, big and open negotiations. Those were like, those are still the criteria though. But what I, as I, as organizers do, obsess about semantics, um, I sort of renamed it um, high participation, high power negotiations, right? By the time I'm in peer review, trying to crank out that book last summer um, and responding to reviewers. And, um, and I think those words, high participation, high power are a better reflection, but the criteria for it and the lesson from every one of those cases you just um, rattled off and the, the German one matters. We, we might note that in the end, um, uh, the sort of myth of Germany and how uh, how these processes worked over there. Um, but it's, it's about transparency. So no ground rules, no gag order. And you're right, you could sign a ground rule that says we all agree to come on time. For me, it's a control thing. So I'm just not gonna agree to any of them. Just teach the workers right away. You don't have to. You don't have to listen to this garbage. Yes, I always just say yes. We're the polite people. We'll be here on time. Next topic. You know, um, who's late? Them. Anyway, so the second one is about electing, electing. Keyword. Very large worker committees. Why? <laughs> because the employer's going to lie through their teeth most of the time at the negotiations table. Most. Sorry, 
True. Sue me. I mean, it's just true. My life experience. And so when you elect a large, when you, when you, when you have a large committee and you can have a large committee and not elect them. So there's two things. You have a large committee. That's a great start. And if you elect them even better, um, but having a large committee by which I mean every single kind of worker covered by the collective agreement, including every one of those workers by different shifts, if it's a differently, sh you know, if they have different shifts, because the experience for a healthcare worker at three in the morning is different than at three in the afternoon. Um, so every kind of worker covering every kind of shift is like the minimum for what should be on a committee. And, you know, in big units, that could mean 200, 300 people, right, easily. Um, if you've got a whole hospital to negotiate, right? You get the techs, the nurses, the dietary, housekeeping, the whole thing. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of different people. And the reason it matters is because no negotiator, I don't care how many times I've done it and how effective I feel doing it, no negotiator is ever going to understand the workplace the way all the workers do. And none of them are going to be able to fact check the employer at right. the table. I, I, when I go to negotiations, there's hundreds of workers in the room with me every single time. And I just get to look around at, you know, for the fact checking uh, because it's going to be immediate and on the spot. It makes the employer effing crazy. So that's, that's big. I prefer elected committees um, because um, I describe it in the chapter on Philadelphia um, I didn't always have it this way, but later, as I as I was aging, you know, in the negotiations and union organizing world, I realized um, the role of the organizing and the structure tests that we call the structure tests. Um, that I wanted workers to understand from day one that if they weren't engaged in participating actively from the contract survey process on, they could make any demand they wanted, but they weren't going to win. So electing committees, I've started to set rules later in my life, and obviously voted on by the workers themselves, that said, um, we're not even going to open up negotiations until 65% of the workers or greater by unit and by shift have filled in the contract survey. We're not even going to put a proposal across the table until at least 65% of you are doing it. And that's a, that's a, I think, beautifully high threshold, right? So from, and when they say, why? We can't get that in our unit. And I say, yes, you can. And when the first unit does it, and get 65% on their initial contract survey, they just hold that up and say, okay, well, this unit did it, so start doing it. And we make the criteria for electing a member of the negotiations committee contingent on high participation in your unit, because you ain't going to win if you aren't teaching the workers from day one. No clever negotiators winning at the table. It's you and your coworkers. And if you're not actively engaging, starting from day one, the building of this contract, the proposals, your opinions, you're not going to win. That, that's just like being honest about the 12 month thing, right? Just be honest with people. They really appreciate honesty, it turns out. And then the last one um, is about open. And when I say open and, and, and Abby Lawler and I mean in the book, we define it. We say open to all the workers covered by the collective bargaining agreement. I actually don't mean open um, to the whole universe. Uh, Maybe my years in Nevada, where there's a very powerful right wing anti tax movement, and I had very large public sector units. You know, if I argued for open, first of all, you wouldn't win under the law. Like, there's case law that says um, that, and I've had to up, you know, I've had to use it because um, many employers have challenged us when we say we're going to let any worker covered by the agreement into the room. Sometimes 500 walk in, uh, that's good. Um, employers will always challenge it. So we've been able to win on that. But also, I wouldn't want it open to everyone. You, you can bring a guest speaker, you know, Barbara Madeloni, who you mentioned, I think. You know, you can bring in one of the case studies from Western Mass, where she's from, but it's the, it's the hospital union, nurses union. They brought people in to speak and testify about the conditions for patients in the community. You're always allowed to bring a guest person to speak. But the right to attend negotiations um, is fundamental for the workers. And so for me, that's the, la that's the final threshold. And it's, and it's so powerful because if you've got a skeptical worker, if management's running a line and then you know that they're lying, you know, it isn't, it's what Lillian did. It's come out of the room, right? I mean, I've in right to work for less states, which I've worked in many of, sharpened my skill and all these things. I would say to the most skeptical worker who was not a dues paying member, um, come out of the room, come out of the room and talk about that proposal because I'm organizing them we hear what they care about. And they're like, yeah, but I'm not a member. But I don't believe in the union. I'm like, that's cool. No problem. 
why don't you just come? We're cool with that. Why don't you just come to negotiations and actually present on that topic? And you know what happens? It's never not happened that even a potentially anti-union worker will walk into that room, see all their coworkers, realize it's the employer that's holding them back and not this thing called the union. And they convert, like they, they change their view um, of what a union is. So those are the cri- those are the things that we pull out from the case studies, from the real life stuff. And they're all recent, right? I mean, 2016 is the oldest one in there. So they're all recent examples, which I always like to do, of workers using effective methods. This is essentially the no shortcuts. This is the organizer's approach to negotiations, right? That's what I was taught. Um, and that's what I'm espousing. And now I had a lot of people, I'll stop here, but it, it was actually the Germans. I was doing a ton of work in Germany starting in 2019 when they translated my first book. And now they're all in German, all, all of the books, including this one's already halfway translated. And they said to me, you keep talking about this big and open negotiation stuff you do you got to spell it out for us because you probably don't just wake up one day, Jane, and open up the room. And I'm like, you're right. We don't. It starts with the contract survey process. And it's not anonymous. And it's one-to-one. And it's an organizing conversation. And you say, if 65% of people in your unit don't get involved in the contract survey, we're not even going to go to the table. So do you want to change things? Okay, we'll get involved. So they literally said to me over and over, a team of organizers in Germany, write a damn book on it so we can credit um, the German organizers for actually making it write the book and then hiring a graduate student named Abby um, who did a great job. Uh, that's amazing. I mean, it really does feel, I think the thing that comes from, from both these books is that organizing is really a practice uh, in many respects, as opposed to a sort of a, a you know, sort of one-off a- a- action. It is something that is ongoing and, um, and, and builds on itself uh, as you, as you go through. Um and 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 I would imagine too. I mean, the the difficult part is it's hard to organize. It's it's hard to negotiate when you have five hundred people who are stakeholders. You know, sort of developing that uh, that position that that makes it more difficult in the short run. But in the long run, what ultimately comes out of that process is a lot more rock solid and a lot more um, undeniable than something that just rests on one person's assumptions of what the different people are going to, are, are going to want in that, uh, in, in that context. Um, I, you know, I, I, I feel like we could talk for hours, uh, about this stuff. Um, Can I just it, say one thing about what the smart comment you just made, because you always make them. That's why I enjoy being here. Just to that point really quickly, the, the point of the 500 in the room and yes, I mean, I've had, I've had national and trade leaders say to me, you're you're crazy to do this you know what i mean they're all just fighting in there and stuff and i'm like oh my god first of all you have a diminished view of workers but second of all what it does sam is it prepares them to know how to defend the agreement once they sign it it builds what we call in the book governing power the first con i say in the book that the the, 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 the this phase between the election where they first learn to build solidarity and unify and overcome management subjections that's the election phase the phase of the first contract negotiations in particular is what I call the governing phase where workers learn how to come to compromises, how to work things out among themselves, how to, how to, how to, how to govern because the left, whatever that means, or progressives in this country have so little experience actually governing that learning how to do it um, is, is the point of the first contract negotiations in my opinion and my life experience. So they're learning what it would take to sort of run their workplace in the case of Einstein, what would it take to really be in charge of your um, place of work, you know, like actually control the production process in some old lingo, like actually make the rules at work and then enforce them. That's what they learn when you're willing to have 500, 400, 300,000 people come in the room. And by the way, during the negotiations, they're silent. So there is a, we have a, there is a, a set of rules that I always ask the workers to embrace, which is when the employer's in the room, everyone's silent. Um, when the employer's not in the room, you know, holy hell happens, and, the, and that's as it should be. Right. You don't want the employer to see any, any. Uh, uh, you know, they, they assume there's going to be dissension because there's always dissension with 500 people, uh, but you don't want them to know where it is, I would imagine, from a, from a strategic or tactical standpoint. All right. So final question, a general one again. How would you describe... Where is it coming from? Because I, I suspect I would know the answer if it's just yes or no. But how would you describe the change 
that you've seen over the past, I don't know, four or five, six, however many years it is. Um, I mean, really, it sort of feels like to me, the big benchmark strike was that Chicago teachers strike. Um, uh, but how would you explain that change? Like, where does it, is it cyclical? Where does it come from? How does it manifest itself? Like what, how, how would you describe that? Because it does feel like there is this sort of change within unions. Some, you feel like the leadership is being pulled by, you know, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the membership and, they're just sort of hanging on for, 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 for dear life, you know, sort of like talking in a way that they think will placate the the membership and others you've seen changes in leadership. Where is it? Where is this coming from? Yeah, I think you're right. It starts in Chicago, um, uh, 2012. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, workers, um, are willing to take high risk um, and fight if they believe there's a credible plan to win. And the term credible plan to win is literally like, that's an art form in the union that trained me. Like those words are not ones I made up. Like I was jammed in my head. For workers to take high risk, they have to understand be part of making it, right? So that's the key thing. Uh, if they're part of making it, high contract survey thresholds, not anonymous, all that stuff, right? They're making a credible plan to win and they're willing to step out of the, out of the security of uh, in, you know, anonymity um, and risk aversion um, and actually take action. So I think it's been really important that there's been some very high profile strikes beginning with Chicago in 2012, um, where people saw workers fighting like mad um, in a massive supermajority strike and winning against the odds, against really stiff opposition. And then you carry that into 2018, you know, and in 2018, we have the highest number of workers on strike in 30 years. Um, that's just before the pandemic, right? Huge education strikes, but not just that, the Marriott strike that we're covering in the book, and um, that was a national Marriott strike against the most powerful corporation in the world. And academics love to say, you know, well, you might be able to take on a school district, Jane, as they like to say to me. But, you know, low wage workers can't take on the largest corporation in the world. And when, OK, that's why we put that fight in there, because, yeah, they damn well did. Right. <laughs> it's about organizing power and strategy and not leaving power on the table. So um, I think it comes from workers seeing other workers winning. That's fundamental yeah. um, to the motivation. And then the abject conditions the employers are putting us under. Everyone, everyone's basically going to be an Uber driver. If, if workers don't fight back right now. Whether you're a writer in Hollywood, a teacher in Oakland, um, you know, a UPS driver, uh, whatever you are, you're just about to become, you know, a, a, a poor, uh, Uberized, um, have no rights, have no future, have no life worker, unless and until people fight back, and they are fighting back. Yeah, it's the give gigification of every sector, and like I mean, it's just it's great that you say that because in reading about the WGA or the the writers strike or earlier today, they cite that as being their number one complaint, and it was the same thing when we covered the UPS uh, pending strike. That's also the same complaint. So there is a theme here where employers understand that this is their most efficient avenue to undercutting labor power is to making is to exploiting these labor or these gig laws. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All the way, completely. And whether or not they're formally exploiting them or informally exploiting them, that is what's happening. Uh, the Titans of Silicon Valley, in fact, are sort of winning these structural changes in the workplace that we've known all along are devastating. And the more workers experience it, uh, the more pissed off they're becoming. And then you add to that a pandemic where people just got shot all over um, by the employer class. And you've, and you've got a bunch of young people um, really uh, who, who, who haven't been steeped in 50 years of McCarthyism or the leftover yeah. of it. Uh, and you've got, a, you got, a nice, you got a nice thing going on right now where workers, thank goodness, um, are feeling a sense of urgency and fighting back. It, it, you know, when you, when you say 2018, that was the year of the red state revolt where you had these non-unionized really uh teachers in states uh, i can't remember all of them but kentucky and uh in, in uh, arizona, West Virginia. arizona yeah states where there was no where you know there was right to work so-called right to work laws and um uh and, and teachers struck back and i remember going to the aft convention that year 
and particularly in the context of the middle, sort of the middle management of the of the of the union, if you will, sort of the more localized leaders, who's who had become, I don't know if radicalized is the right word, but they they certainly were like didn't realize we could do that. Like they, they, you know, they had been in the union for a long time and they would just sort of had gotten into a place where they just, it was taken as granted that they had no power. Mm. And when they saw these teachers, it reinvigorated their sort of sense of like, maybe going on strike is not such the like sort of terrifying thing and, and futile thing that we, we thought it was. And it really seemed to impact people. And I, and I feel like that has just built upon itself. Well, you know, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the Glacier Northwest Teamsters uh, and the UPS um, uh, strike, which we could be just a couple of months away from. Uh, we, we're going to have to have you back to talk about those things. These are going to be important things. Uh, you really do get the sense, particularly with the UPS thing, if that if that UPS strike happens, this is something that is going to be sort of national national in a way that we haven't really, you know, Starbucks is national, but it's a series of like sort of local localized things. This UPS thing is going to be something that I think like you know, people in one state and 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 the pilots they know and the pilots as well. I mean, this could be a very very important summer in terms of uh, uh, a labor action. And oh, oh yeah, oh we should. It's so funny you say that because I literally this weekend uh, just wrote two different opinion pieces that I'm pitching places. Um, one is on Glacier and what it means. Um, and one is on the UPS UAW, the change in leadership. Um, I don't want to give it away now, but uh, analogizing it to some recent other struggles um, and talking about the promise um, of what may come. So both topics, things that are central in my mind, I'm writing about them. Um, and would love to come back and talk about them anytime. Fant fantastic. Well, the uh, the book is uh, Rules to Win by Power and Participation in Union Negotiations, uh, written by Jane McAlevey. And of course, uh, with uh, Abby Lawler, we will put a link to that at majority.fm and in the podcast and YouTube description. Jane, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Likewise. Great to see you, Sam and Emma and the whole crew behind all of you. Thanks. Thank you Thanks. so much, Jane.